2 Kings 12, verses 1 to 12. 2 Kings 12, 1 to 12. <clears throat> In the seventh year, Jehu, the seventh year of Jehu, Johash became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 40 years. His mother was Zibia, and she was from Beersheba. Joash did what was right in the eyes of God all the years Jehoda, the priest, instructed him. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burnt incense there. Joash said to the priests, Collect all the money that is, to, that is brought as sac sacred offerings to the temple of the Lord. The money collected in the census, the money received from the personal vows, and the money brought voluntarily to the temple. Let every priest receive money from one of the treasures, and then use it to repair whatever damage is found in the temple. But by the 23rd year of King Joash, the priest still had not repaired the temple. That's a long time. Therefore, King Joash summoned Jehoda, the priest, and the other priests and asked them, why aren't you repairing the damage done to the temple? Take no more money from your treasures, but hand it over for repairing of the temple. The priests agreed that they would not collect any more money from the people and that they would re not repair the temple themselves. Jehoda, the priest, took a chest and bore a hole in its lid. He placed it beside the altar and on the right side as one enters the temple of the Lord. The priest who guarded the entrance put into the chest all the money that was brought to the temple of the Lord. Whenever they saw that there was a large amount of money in the chest, they called the treasurer. Oh, sorry. The um, large amount of money in the chest, the royal secretary and the high priest came and counted the money that had been brought into the temple of the Lord and put it into bags. When the amount had been determined, they gave the money to the men appointed to supervise the work of the temple. When they paid those who worked on the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, the builders, the masons, and the stonecutters, they purchased lumber and blocks of dressed stone for the repair of the temple and met all the other expenses of restoring the temple. Hunter, please join us. Thank you. So this is, I believe, our last sermon in the series on Old Testament characters. Somewhere along the way, uh, someone in our church asked me, how do you come up with like, what you're going to preach on on any given Sunday? It's an excellent question. For the people that know me really well or those poor people that have to work with me, uh, it probably doesn't surprise you at all that I have absolutely no idea how I come up with this stuff. Uh, I think for this series, I just asked on Facebook, what are your favorite Old Testament characters? And we sort of ran with it. And the worship planning committee came up with a couple of the names. And one of the names that the worship planning committee came up with was Joash, the seven-year-old king. And I thought, well, that sounds like fun. And I read the story, and I was left scratching my head thinking, Hunter, where in the world are you going to go with this? But when we sit and we spend time with the Scripture uh, often for me, stuff starts to come up. And I found this story to be a delightful one. An interesting story that sort of brought out for me some interesting ways uh, of looking at God and the way God moves. To understand this story fully, we have to look back a little bit farther. Sometimes it is the backstory that is the most interesting. In this case, the backstory is kind of wild. Joash was a king, so he was, of course, of the time of the kings. We have been studying, the past two weeks, we, we studied two leaders that were judges. In the times of the judges, the people of Israel lived as nomadic herders, and they had their herds, and they would take their tents, and they would move around, and when they were attacked by someone, God would rise up a leader, and they would fight back, and they would be fine. But the people didn't really love this way of being. They wanted a king. Everybody else has a king. Why shouldn't we have a king? They wanted a standing military. Everybody else has a standing military. Why shouldn't we have a standing military? So finally, God gives in, and he gives them a king. But just like the human beings, they would follow God for a little while and then sort of lose focus and follow some other gods, so too the kings made lots of mistakes. And the king's stories were filled with treachery and all kinds of stuff. 
Joash's grandparents were a woman named Athalia and Jehoram. Jehoram was the king, Athalia was his wife. Athalia was a worshiper of Baal. Jehoram was killed in battle, and their son, Ahaziah, became the king. But it wasn't long until Ahaziah himself was killed, and suddenly Athalia felt her power and her influence slipping through her fingers. So she made a move that would come right out of some sort of fantasy novel or a TV series like Game of Thrones. She had the entire royal court assassinated. If we think about this a little bit, she was the queen, and she had the entire royal court assassinated, which means she most likely had her own children and grandchildren put to death because she wanted to be the sovereign. She wanted to be in charge. But Ahazia's sister must have somehow gotten wind of what was about to happen, and she grabbed little one-year-old Joash and went into hiding. The entire royal court was eliminated except for the two of them, and they hid for seven years. During that time of seven years, Jehoiada the priest was out sort of drumming up interest in finding out who might still be loyal to the real king. And after six years in hiding, he decided it was time for their own coup. He put the king, he walked Joash, seven-year-old Joash, in and set him right next to the throne. And he had all the guards prepare themselves. And when Athalia came in and she saw Joash sitting there and she panicked and thought, what am I to do? And called for her guards. She found that no one at that point was loyal to her. And Athalia herself was then assassinated. And now, seven-year-old Joash is the king. And in the stories of the kings and even in the stories of Chronicles, often we'll see one chapter, just sort of the main thing that a king did in their time of leadership. The thing that Joash does, unquestionably encouraged by Jehoiada the priest, he was only seven, his first order of business was to rebuild the temple. Again, Athalia was a Baal worshiper. So, assumably, for those six years that she was in charge, she didn't care about that temple. They may have even worshipped Baal, thrown away all the things that would remind anyone of their one God, and, and allowed the temple to become in disarray and falling apart. So, Joash asks the um, priests to, to collect all of their money to bring that as their, all of their sacred offerings and to bring that and give it to people for repair. What is kind of hard to understand is what happened for the 23 years in between. That uh, decree that you are to rebuild the temple and nothing happening. Though I can imagine, they probably got distracted. They still had some, Athelia's, some of Athalia's people to deal with. They still had others that were coming to attack them. All sorts of things that might have been happening, all sorts of distractions going on. And we know people, and the priests were priests, but they were still people. I can imagine the priests kind of looking at each other and saying, hey, um, we're supposed to be giving all of our money to rebuild the temple. Um, don't you think we could probably do it ourselves better and save a whole bunch of money? Uh, or you're, you, how much are you going to give? Well, I don't know how much you're going to give. Well, I'm not going to give anything if you're not going to give anything. Well, I'm not going to. And before we know what happens, nothing happens. I love that Joash somehow figures it out in 23 years and comes to the priests and tells them that now it's supposed to happen, and they said they would not repair the temple themselves anymore. If you ever see me doing any repairs on this building, stop me quickly and call someone that knows what they're doing. So Jehoiada takes a box, and he drills a hole in it, and the money goes straight into that box, doesn't even go to the priests anymore. They don't trust those people with that money. They've already proven themselves untrustworthy. And all that money is given to the carpenters, to the masons, to the stone cutters for the rebuilding of the temple. And this was the great work that Joash did. He rebuilt the temple. So what does that have for us in our common day thinking? Where do we go with this? And I thought about it, and I said, you know, I mean, we've been doing some pretty amazing renovations here in this place. Is there a connection? 
We've renovated the hallways. We've, re- we've renovated uh, the fellowship hall. I don't, I don't know what kind of comments you all have gotten, but I have gotten some unbelievably amazing compliments. I have had pastors from the ACC saying that we should have every single meeting. Every single ACC meeting should be in our fellowship hall because it's that amazing and wonderful. Those are good things to hear. And we had a worship planning committee that got together to develop a plan for the church. And they came up with this plan of renovating the basement. Renovating, let's not call it the basement. Let's call it the children's ministry wing. Um, To renovate the children's ministry wing. To add on to the building so that we could add on ministries. People talk about possibly renovating, renovating the kitchen. You know, is there something here? Now, when we talk about this stuff, one of the things that comes up is, you know, why would we spend all this money on ourselves? Isn't there, you know, all this money that we could spend, couldn't we spend it on things that are, are far more important? I think there's a tension that starts to develop. How much do we spend on ourselves? How much do we spend on our building? And how much do we spend on the problems and the brokenness of the world? And I think this scripture, I love, I love the way scripture does this, I think this scripture, this story could be used to support both sides. In a way, we can look at it and we can say, this is our temple, and this is a place that we need to refurbish, that we need to take care of. And another way, you could look at it and say, well, maybe this is just a representation of the broken world that we live in, a world that has seemingly not been taken care of in the way that it should be, a world that's broken and falling apart, and it's our job with Jesus to make the world into a better place. And so we have this tension What is the value of the space? What should we spend there? And and what is the value of making the world into a better place? And I'm going to make the argument that we have to do both. That both things are super duper important. And there are some things that we need to remember. One of the things that we have to remember when we think about this space is that there is something, there's something about space If you're someone that likes to pray, you probably have a favorite place where you go to pray. You have a place where you like to be and you settle yourself into that spot and it just feels special. And one of the places for me has always been in in the sanctuary, in the sanctuary of Zion Mennonite Church or in the sanctuary here. And I think in the temple, uh, they used to burn incense. And the incense would, smoke would waft up into the ceiling And there was the image for them of their prayers being lifted up to God. And I would imagine that ceiling kind of got dark, darkened by the soot of the incense. And I wonder to myself, sometimes when I allow my imagination to be like that of a child, what if we could see soot on our walls? What if we could see the soot of the incense of all the songs that we have sung together? What if we could see, and if we could read that incense, if we had ability to see the different colors and say, oh, that mark over there, that represents the hundreds of times that we have come together as a community to take communion together. Oh, and that spot back there, that represents great is thy faithfulness. How many times we've sung that amazing song to encourage faithfulness in our midst. That new spot over there, that's Oceans from uh, Hillsong United. We like that song too. And what about the baptisms? The children that have lined up in front of us year after year to be baptized, to choose to follow Jesus. Even the, the incense that we might see in our children's ministry wing where children have been empowered in faith, have been taught the stories of the Bible and to understand God. Or the fellowship hall where we have cared for each other and all of the prayers, all of the many people that we have brought into this center of this room to be prayed for. And each one of those prayers is absorbed in this building somehow. There's something very important about this space. And it is within this space because of the people that are in it. Let's be honest. It's the people in the space. It's not the space, but it's the people in the space that carry the Holy Spirit. But this is where we come. This is where we come to meet, to be changed by God, to be empowered by God to do great things. 
And this is the place where many of us have heard sermons about giving, sermons about doing missions, sermons about making the world a better place. This is the place that inspires giving. Dean and I looked at our budget over the past 10 years, and we figured very loosely that we've probably given out of our budget alone $2 million million every 10 years to missions, straight into missions. But that's just the stuff that's in the budget. Inspired by what happens in this place, people have given hundreds of thousands of dollars to other causes, to colleges, to other Christian organizations, all of those things inspired by the meetings in this place. And someone, some crazy person, uh, somewhere along the way, counted how many volunteer hours we have at this church. And I think they came up with like 6,800 volunteer hours uh, in a given year, which at minimum wage comes out to be about $50,000 or so just given in our volunteer hours. And that's minimum wage. I don't know how many of you make minimum wage, but I'm going to guess it's not that many. Here in this place, something special and amazing happens. And we need to keep this place looking right and refurbished. But we should have those concerns about what are we doing for others because of the tension. One of the things that I love about this church, absolutely positively love about this church, and love design was the exact same way. Maybe it's just because we're Mennonites. Every time we have a budget meeting, people get their cackles up and get all upset about what? What the pastors make? Nope. They get all upset and wound up about what we're giving to other organizations. Why aren't we giving more here? Why aren't we doing more about this? And we have this sense of understanding that the world needs some refurbishing, that the world needs to be a better place, and it's our job to participate in that. It is my belief that we can do both. God is calling us to make this world a better place. God calls us together in this place to hear that message over and over and over again. Several weeks ago, I preached a sermon about daring to be courageous, and Bob Unruh heard that sermon, and he said, I want to be courageous. He said, Hunter, what can we do to be courageous in Puerto Rico? And I said, Bob, why don't we do something with the Atlantic Coast Conference? Why don't we grab our conferences and get them together and do something amazing and wonderful for the world around us? What about Puerto Rico? And he said, yeah, let's do that. Let's talk to MCC about doing hygiene kits. But he talked to MCC. And MCC had boots on the ground in Puerto Rico, and they said, we don't need hygiene kits. We need food. And so the Atlantic Coast Conference has started up a ministry where we are going to collect $40,000 all from all Atlantic, not, not $40,000 from each church, we want $40,000 from all the Atlantic Coast Conference churches. And we are going to do, here in this place, we're going to do a, a, an offering next week for that. And I'll explain a little bit more. The $40,000 will create 2,000 health kits, not health kits, food boxes, to go to Puerto Rico. Rice and beans, things that they eat. Oregon Dairy, God bless them, is going to buy the food for us at their cost. We're going to pay for it, of course, but they're going to buy it at cost. And then on November 12th, 13th, and 14th, do I have those dates right, Dean? Do you remember? Anybody remember that was here earlier this morning, 12th, 13th, and 14th? 13th, 14th, and 15th? Thank you. November 13th, 14th, and 15th, from 6.30 to 8.30, we can go to the Material Resource Center and put those boxes together together as a conference. This is some of the things that we can do to make this world a better place, to refurbish the world that we are living in. And we had this beautiful, amazing um, videos that we saw from MDS, this incredible Mennonite organization, probably one of the best relief organizations in the world, who is rebuilding houses who is building all kinds of houses, doing all sorts of wonderful things to refurbish and to rebuild places that have been destroyed by natural disasters. And we have the opportunity to participate with that. The elders and I are working on a courageous plan, and you will hear more about it when we're willing to talk more about it. But part of that plan involves MDS. And I, I don't... Where's Dave at? Dave, are you ready? Did I told you this was going to happen, right? This morning, Dave Lemon came to me, and he, and, he, and he said that he's got this feeling something is brewing in our church. Come on. Something's brewing in our church. Something is happening. 
And we need to sort of be preparing ourselves and getting ready for it because something is happening in, in our midst with MDS and with whatnot. And he, and he came to me and he had as much or more passion about it than I do. So I'm just going to let you talk about what God has been stirring in you, Dave. Um, our small group had been talking about um, the challenge that Hunter had given us uh, several weeks ago about um, daring to be courageous. And as we were talking about that, we are like, what part of our lives... Um, what would that look like in our lives? Um, and as we talked, giving money was the easy part. But we're like, what is the part that is a struggle that would really make us think um, about what we're doing? And we came up with the idea that time, our time is really valuable. And that would be the struggle that we would have as a small group to be involved, to what can we do to be courageous that's more than just opening my wallet and throwing some cash in. This morning in my um, prayer time, I knew we were talking about MDS this morning and um, wasn't quite sure where to go with any of that, but as I was thinking about MDS, I was, um, my, my uh, devotion time this morning was reading through Nehemiah uh, where they're rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Um, people had been exiled, uh, taken into captive and scattered around the land and then um, the exiles were allowed to come home but they came back to this place that was just devastated. There was nothing left and I was thinking about that and MDS and I'm thinking man that's what MDS is doing. They are rebuilding stuff that was devastated and it's all over the United States. There's hundreds of not hundreds, there's dozens of places across the United States where they, are, where they are working. And as I was listening this morning to the videos and, and um, just knowing what MDS does and um, what almost made my heart cry but almost made my heart leap for joy was when he said, how many of you have been involved in MDS? And Praise the Lord, there were people out there that raised their hands. And Mom Piper, I don't know where you are, but <laughs> you, list, you rattled off like five or six places that you had been over your lifetime, and that's just great. And my thought was, if he comes back next year, I want to see more than four or five hands raised. I want to see everybody's hand raised that's there for that. And what God has placed in my heart, and we're saying daring to be courageous, what would it look like if we as a church would say, you know what, we are going to commit to MDS every day for a year in some way. And he rattled off a list of opportunities that I think are possible for our congregation. Now, there are snowbirds, and pardon the expression, that are heading to Florida here shortly. That is a couple hour drive from where they have an MDS unit set up in Florida. And my challenge is to those that are going to Florida, can you take a day instead of playing golf or taking a walk or riding a bike, can you go down there and offer words of encouragement? Can you go down there and do whatever God has laid before you to do that? There are opportunities for families. Now, I'm not an MDS spokesperson. I have not been involved in MDS, but I know the value of being a part of missions, whether it's local or far away. Um, there are opportunities for families. Instead of a family vacation this year, say, you know what? I'm gonna take my kids and we're gonna be involved in a family work effort for MDS. We have done that with our children and I think um, I came away blessed and I think they've come away blessed with new opportunities and opened their eyes in different ways. Um, there are opportunities for the youth to get involved in MDS projects, and they're local. They're close by. We don't have to go halfway around the world. We can build a house in our parking lot. All we need to do is raise the money and have the hands. So that's what God laid on my heart, Hunter. And that's a challenge that, that for whatever reason, has come through whatever I've been praying about. So my challenge is, can we do this for a year? Can we do it for five? Just a thought. So, thanks Dave. I'll let you go back and sit down now and 
for my beloved children. I'll try and button it up really quick. King Joash makes it into this book because he started a renovation project. How will each and every one of us look upon our years, the next five years, the next six years, the next 10 years at Nestville Mennonite Church? Can we be a part of a renovation project, renovating this building, renovating uh, the world around us, and renovating our hearts? Because one of the things Dave alluded to was when we go on trips like this, we do things for MDS, we find that we are changed more than the people that we go to help. There is a call to be courageous. There is a call to be a part of a renovation project, renovating our building, renovating the world around us, and renovating our hearts. And Jesus will be with us the whole way. Through his death and resurrection, the resurrection is where we see this renovation, and Christ will be with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you. Something is stirring here in this church. I can feel it. It was there this morning as we heard stories about MDS. It's in our devotions. It's in our prayer times. It's in our scripture reading and in our sermons. You are calling us and inviting us to be courageous. You are calling us and inviting us to be renovators, caring for others, allowing you to change our hearts. Lead us and guide us, Jesus. We still don't know what it's going to look like, but it starts to become more clear and more clear every day, and we thank you. Lead us and guide us through this process and through this time. In the name of Christ, amen.